exhibition uh, grows out of a research project that I did mainly in Rome in 2006-2010 and uh, the, I, the guiding idea is to look at the history of socially excluded groups or socially marginal places in Italy since unification. Uh, as I worked on the project I became interested in focusing on a number of areas so rather than doing a comprehensive history I took five case studies. Um, one is the creation of urban peripheries, peripheral areas of the cities that expanded after unification, Rome because of the tertiary sector, Milan and uh, Turin because of industrialization in general. And as these cities expanded they created um, physical peripheries, areas of poor housing where migrants had come from other parts of Italy tended to settle because it was too expensive to move further in. So that part of the exhibition is the creation of uh, urban slums. Um, modern slums are a new phenomenon in Italy. There's obviously been poor areas of housing going back to antiquity, but the modern slum has a particular kind of characteristic. Um, high density of residents in small spaces, overcrowding, disease, um, poor lighting, poor sanitation and so on. I didn't design the book and the exhibition to be a kind of counter history of United Italy. However, if you're a historian and you look at the growth of any modern nation state, one of the things you see is that the formation of nations themselves and the growth of a capitalist economy produces um, peripheral or marginal areas. Um, wealthy areas of cities are balanced out by poor areas. Uh, rich metropolises are balanced out by poorer colonies, which are a source of raw materials or cheap labour. Um, the creation of a society of healthy people creates areas of uh, poor health, particularly poor mental health. So one of the areas I looked at was the creation of the manicomi, of uh, um, what used to be called mental asylums or psychiatric hospitals. So uh, I see the construction of marginality as in some ways a normal byproduct of the growth of nations. I'm not suggesting that Italy is a pathological case, that it has more marginality than anywhere else. What I wanted to look at was the way that if you want to tell a complete history of Italian developments into unification, you have to tell the story of these subaltern groups and not just the story of the winners or the, um, the dominant elites. The photographers in the exhibition weren't chosen for artistic criteria. I didn't want to do an artistic photography exhibition because this started as a project of historical investigation. I wanted to choose photographs that uh, represented uh, different ways of looking at marginality. So for the late 19th century, these are those kinds of photographers who saw poverty as picturesque. People like Ettore Rizzo of France, who did photographs of um, areas of Rome that he knew were um, marked for demolition and wanted to capture them before they were demolished. So, for instance, parts of Trastevere uh, or Testaccio as it developed um, were demolished and he wanted to capture that, that last moment of a, a dying area. So there's a, a picturesque tinge or quality to the way in which he photographs poverty, which interests me. Hopping to the 1950s, uh, I've got a series of photographs taken in Rome, quite famous ones, by Franco Pinna, uh, which are photographs taken in the Mandrione area of Rome, where there was a, um, a Roma population already, um, Roma and Sinti living there in the 1950s, um, but also very poor people living in shanties, in, in self-built housing, in the arches of the Aquedotto Felice in that part of Rome. Um, and he did a kind of photographic series, originally for the magazine Vie Nuove, the Communist Weekly, on these socially marginalized groups. Um, another example, uh, photographs by Arturo Zavattini, son of the screenwriter and novelist uh, Cesare Zavattini, who did a series of photographs in Tricarico, um, the town in Basilicata where Rocco Scottellaro was mayor, where he came from, uh, which capture moments of um, community life in Tricarico in, in the early 1950s. There's a section of the exhibition that I call Souths, with the in the plural, not South, 
um, for a number of reasons. One is I think the concept of the mezzogiorno or a single south has been widely challenged. Um, people, economists or historians who work on the south say that it's a highly internally varied region um, with different kinds of economic activity, different subcultures, urban, rural, but also more developed, less developed. And one of the things you see in Italy, particularly after 1945, is a kind of divergence between different parts of the South. Some parts, for instance, those selected for industrialization, the so-called poli di sviluppo of the um, Casa per il Mezzogiorno, uh, particularly around the ports, become uh, industrial centers. Others in that process become more underdeveloped or they don't follow the same pace of development. So a kind of bifurcation takes place within the South. That's one reason I talk about Souths in the plural. Um, the other is that I'm interested in the work of Ernesto De Martino, the ethnologist and uh, uh, historian of religion who worked on magic and popular belief in the South. And he had previously worked on non on cultures outside Italy. He'd used mainly written sources but worked on African and Siberian cultures. And he was very aware that after 1945, the south of Italy, generally the, the southern Mediterranean peripheries of Europe, so Greece, Portugal, southern Spain, were part of a wider global south. They were the undeveloped bits of Europe that were being left behind in the convergence towards a more modern and uh, industrialized culture. So he saw them politically as linked to the rest of the world, the, the, the poor south in the rest of the world. The section called Asylums uh, contains a series of photographs and film extracts about um, what were called in English lunatic asylums, um, in uh, America usually mental asylums, uh, and in Italian manicomi. Um, and these were the long-stay institutions where people classified as mentally ill uh, and usually as dangerous to themselves or to others. This was the phrasing of the law of 1904 allowed doctors to put them in long-stay institutions. These could be people as young as 12 or 13 who often got internalized in these institutions and stayed there until they died. Um, in the 1960s, a campaign developed in Italy to close these institutions or to open them, the same thing really, either to knock down the walls to make them um, more permeable to the world outside or to get rid of them altogether and allow these patients to be transferred into community care schemes. This is part of a, an international movement at the time. Uh, the leading figure in this, or the one who's best known, is Franco Besaglia, who was uh, head of a psychiatric hospital, first in Gorizia and then in Trieste and then in a number of other places, who was uh, extremely politicized and saw this question not just as one of human rights, the rights of the patients to be in a community and to have a normal life, uh, but also a critique of um, the kind of marginality created by capitalism, by a socially unjust economic system. Um, so he led this campaign with others to, um, to get rid of these marginal areas. I see colonies as an interesting kind of margins because uh, clearly what were called colonies or the colonies of European countries in the 19th century up until the mid 20th century when most colonies um, stopped being colonies and became independent states uh, were clearly places which had their own histories, their own internal complex cultures, uh, their own indigenous populations. But from the point of view of the countries that colonized them, they were indeed margins of uh, the homeland. They were places where you sent um, migrant workers from poor areas who couldn't find work in your own, in your own country. They became sources of raw material. Uh, they were exploited for minerals and so on. And very often the, usually happened in most con colonial situations, is the local population was subjugated, were treated harshly, didn't have the same rights as the colonizers. So in that sense, it's a very clear case of a dependency on the, um, on the metropolitan country back in Europe. Uh, and what interested me in this section was that Italy had a very brief colonial history compared to, say, Brit Britain or France. It got its colonies in the 1880s, uh, the first ones, and it lost them all in the 1940s. So it had a 60-year uh, maximum period of colonization. Ethiopia, which is where most of these photographs come from, had the shortest of all. It was 1936 and 1941, so just five years of colonization. And you might say the Italians couldn't have done very much harm in that period or very much good. 
And in fact, it was now known, I think, by historians to have been a brutal occupation because this was the high fascist period. Uh, a kind of apartheid system was declared there. Um, the towns were redesigned so the indigenous population were put on the margins of the cities uh, and so that the, the white colonial elites could be housed in buildings in the centre. So the kind of centre periphery structure that you saw in Italy's cities in the 1880s became reproduced in the marginal cities of the colony. The last section of the exhibition is called Migrants, Nomads and Others, and it's the most mixed of the sections, but it's also the one that contains the most recent photographs. Um, since the 1980s, Italy has become a destination country for migrants from poorer parts of the world. Um, as I think is generally known, from the 1880s till the 1960s, Italy was a country of net emigration, where Italians who were poorer people would go to find work in other richer countries. And that trend becomes reversed after 1980, and it brings a whole new set of problems and a whole new set of marginal people into Italy. Um, very often migrants from poorer parts of the world, this can be from North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Philippines, uh, and increasingly in the last uh, 10 years from parts of Eastern Europe, um, very often follow the same pattern of peripheralization as poorer Italian internal migrants within the 1880s to the 1940s. That is to say they come to live on um, poor peripheral areas of the cities, often in the very same locations that the Italian internal migrants lived in in the 1940s and 50s, in fact, some of the very same dwellings. Uh, a good example is the camp uh, called Casilino Novecento on the Via Casilina in Rome, which was in the 1960s and 70s occupied mainly from migrant workers from the Abruzzo um, or other parts of um, central southern Italy. Um, when they moved out to go into regular housing in the late 1970s, the Roma, um, the migrant population from uh, the Balkans, moved in and they were then displaced in 2010 by orders of the mayor of Rome, Gianni Alemanno, who decided to push them even further out to a new periphery outside the Raccordo Andulare. So what's interesting, I think, about this process, this history, is that we can link patterns of marginalization that began to form soon after unification, and we see them being reproduced either in the colonies in the 1930s um, or in the very same cities in which they had been uh, created uh, a century before now in the 2000s.